Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky, see your hand in time, in mind to lead me through the night. I'm going to start a series, and it's going to be a long series. I may preach until fall. Well, I will preach until fall, but on this same passage of Scripture. And you know what? Here's, here's what I hope you'll do. That along with me, you'll read it and reread the same passage. That you'll pray through these verses week in and week out. I pray you'll come to these services ready. I wonder what aspect he'll talk about today. I look forward to hearing your responses, Pastor. I I thought about that also, but this is the way it struck me. That we as a body would go through this, not just me as the preacher. Y'all with me? I'm going to read this passage of Scripture, and then I'll have you be seated after that. 2 Peter 1, I'm going to read 15 verses Scripture says this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Now look at this. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, has forgotten what he was cleansed from, that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Everyone say succeed. Succeed. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you say it again? Succeed. Succeed. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Can you say, in Jesus' name? name. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Tom, will you do me a favor and move the direction of that thing or turn it off, that fan right there? I don't have a lot of coverage and protection on my noggin, and that thing is cold. So I'm going to need to have that moved. Thank you so much for helping out an old bald guy. Way to go. Thank you, Brother Tom. This is from a letter of Peter. Peter wrote two letters. He's the author. 
The preceding letter is also by him, the Apostle Peter. I want you to think in your mindset right now. What do you know about the Apostle Peter? What comes to your mind about the Apostle Peter? I wonder how many of you right now are seeing the character in the Chosen series. <laughs> what, are, what are Peter's memorable actions in the Gospels or in the book of Acts? Peter was trained a fisherman. And let's face it, his beginning with Jesus, his early times with Jesus was a bit of a roller coaster. Some highs and lows. This is not a guy who met Jesus and then just got in line and had it all nailed down. This is a guy who one day you're thinking, man, he can hang the moon in the kingdom of God. And the next day you're thinking, where did we get this guy? That's Peter. He walked on water, then sank. He declared Jesus is the Messiah and then denied him three times. He directed the disciples' prayer meeting on the day of Pentecost and later he preached to the crowd that was gathered on that day and more than 3,000 were entered into the kingdom by baptism and the infilling of the Spirit. Peter, he's the guy that in chapter 3 had the faith to see a lame man healed at the gate beautiful. Peter testified of Jesus before the Jewish Sanhedrin in the religious legal system of the day. It was Peter that confronted Ananias and Sapphira's lie. It was Peter that confronted Simon the sorcerer for his wrong motive. It was Peter that had the faith to see Dorcas raised from the dead. Peter had the courage to take the gospel to the house of Cornelius and to the Gentile population. Peter, a storied disciple with a, a broad experience. Now, he wasn't a prolific writer like the Apostle Paul. But he wrote these two letters. And he explained in these letters how Christians should respond when they suffer because of their beliefs. Not because they did something dumb. Not because of self-inflicted trouble. But because of their beliefs. Because of following Jesus, they were suffering. Some refer to Peter as the apostle of hope. His primary message, trust the Lord. Live obediently no matter what your circumstance. Keep your hope fixed on God's ultimate promise of deliverance. Peter instructs us that suffering can be expected, but it's temporary. And it yields great blessings for those who remain steadfast in the kingdom. Peter probably wrote that first epistle in the mid-60s A.D., the second epistle that we already read from, he arrived a few years later. In that second epistle, he addresses false teachers and doctrinal confusion. Already within a few decades of Jesus Christ, his teaching, his preaching, his impact on society, the gospels as they've been shared, already foolishness and twistedness and confusion and deception was entering in. And Peter warned about that. He wrote those words of Second Peter near the time of his death, near the conclusion of his life and ministry. We read it in our text. He knew his time was coming. And so he's passing along some final words, if you will. Tradition is this, that Peter died a martyr in Rome about 67 AD. He was approximately 75 years old. Jesus had predicted in the book of John that there would be a violent death for Peter. It's thought that it came about by crucifixion, just like Christ under the reign of Nero. 
It's, it's spoken and said that at Peter's request, if I'm to be crucified, I will not be crucified in the same manner as my Savior. I'm not worthy of that. Turn me upside down. Why are Peter's words important to us? How can we benefit? You know, of a handful of topics that Peter addresses in these couple of short letters, two of them stand out that I bring to our attention today. False doctrine and suffering. And the suffering, again, is due to Jesus' doctrine and Jesus' practices. It was suffering in that day and time due to the hands of government and politics and workplace issues. There were antagonists that were contrary. There were attacks on the beliefs of Christ Jesus. Suffering because of kingdom beliefs. False doctrine was sown in there, teaching and practices that were contrary to Christ, due to, in their day, what we would call influencers. People that gathered a crowd, people that gathered an audience, people that had a selection of likes in their era on their pages, and so they were spreading error and wrong values and wrong ideas and wrong actions, some of them under the banner of supposed faith. They would claim enough a bit of what Jesus taught and then would distort it and contort it. And that's what Peter is coming against in Second Peter because false prophets were denying that Jesus would come again. That the dead was raised and he would return for his disciples and they were teaching against that. Because they were teaching against that, they said, he's not coming back. He's not going to return. There will not be judgment of people upon this earth. Therefore, they taught. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you act. And so there was great immorality coming and ungodly lifestyles because of these false teachers. They would willfully satisfy their sinful desires, including greed, sexual immorality, and gluttony. And these false teachers would especially attack recent converts that were just escaping those very sins. Can I? Hmm. It is not accidental that those who are new to Christ, all of a sudden some uncle's brother's cousin who never professed Christ before wants to reach out and start talking about all of their profound faith that they haven't lived, that they don't do, that they don't practice. But all of a sudden you're taking a step in faith and somebody comes out of the blue uh, to calm you down a little bit, to tell you you don't need Jesus, to try to get you to realize, no, oh, you don't need to do all that. Listen, and that's a trick of the devil that started from the beginning of the gospel and prior to that that the enemy whispers like the snake in the garden oh you don't need all that false teachers another apostle by the name of Jude in fact you can see this similar theme even in Galatians under Paul's writing they express concerns in Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Protect seriously the faith, which was once delivered... For all, to the, for all delivered to the saints. Verse 4, certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the elements that Peter provides in this passage, the elements that we're going to look at more closely in the messages in weeks to come, the things that he said, if 
you do these things, you will never stumble. Those are the things that allow all believers to override the primary concerns of suffering and false beliefs. If I'm going to be succeeding in the kingdom of God, we ought to pay attention to the things that Peter has to say. Because you know as well as I do, unless you've been hiding in a mountain cabin somewhere with your head under a rock. False teachers abound. Not only in a traditional means as the church has endured over the centuries, but now via the internet. False teaching is both overt and subtle. It's arguably easier and more prolific now than ever. And in such an increasingly non-Christian world, Jesus teaching our beliefs face attack as did the early church. In many cases, if we have it, we will. We will suffer for what we believe. It may not be suffering to some, but you'll think it's suffering when someone is promoted with less talent than you because you took a stand for what you believe. In third world countries, that's not suffering, but you and I would think it was suffering. Let me tell you, I was finished with this message and just praying today and finishing up my praying. And I opened up, checked a few things. I got a link to a news article published today by a local newspaper. Today. Taking attack at five churches in one of our cities in Snohomish County. The news reporters listened to more than 100 messages from those five churches and declared those messages were rife with what they determined is harmful rhetoric. today. What's harmful rhetoric? Sharing the Word of God. Sharing what you and I believe is the faith. Sharing what you and I recognize is going to be able to transform our lives into being more Christ-like. I wonder how many of us have listened to a hundred messages recently to discern what was going on in the preaching. But somebody contrary, you hearing me? Interested to find and decipher? Do you think they took things out of context? I don't know, but probably. How is it okay for others to declare their rhetoric that you and I find harmful? But it's not okay for you and I to declare the Word of God regardless of others would find it harmful. I'm talking about the day in which you and I live. That's not in some repressive regime somewhere around the world. That's in our county, in one of our cities, written in one of our newspapers. Are you all with me? It's relevant that we pay attention in this day and age that we live. You and I need to do what we can to be succeeding in the kingdom of God. So Peter is writing these words and he says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 12, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in this present truth. Let me just throw this out. Regardless of how much you and I know the Scripture and are convinced of the Scripture and we recognize what God is calling us to be, it is always healthy to be reminded of the Scripture. It's healthy to be reminded of what I've already known. It's helpful to be reminded and review the things that I have traveled over before. Peter recognizes, I'm fixing to share some things that you already know. I'm fixing to share some things that you've already understood. I'm fixing to share some things that you've had as a habit in your life. But I'm going to remind you again. He goes in verse 13 to make it clear. I think it's right to remind you. He didn't apologize for reminding. 
He said, as long as I'm in this tent talking about his humanity to stir you up by reminding you, verse 14, shortly I'm going to put off this tent. He realized his time was short. He was going to pass and be with the Lord. I'm not always going to be here, he says. So in verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. How did he do that? We've got this letter. We've got this letter. Peter came to the place where he summarized and realized, I came into this thing in a bumpy kind of way. I had some great experiences, but I did some foolish things. But now here I am in my 70s, and the Lord is calling me home, and I've recognized how to do this right. I've recognized what succeeding is all about in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to write it down, because I want everybody in the kingdom to know this thing's about success. This thing is about victory. And I want you to know how to live succeeding lives. Mm. You realize that God's plan isn't designated for stumbling. Peter stumbled. Peter failed. But he knew finally how to overcome those things. The kingdom of God is not for failure. It's not for stumbling. The Lord's plan is success. He's teaching us from his decades of ministry, his personal knowledge. Because you see, he's been guilty of forgetting. He's been guilty of nearsightedness. And he knew how it harmed him in his walk with Christ. So he wrote him down so that you and I would succeed. 2 Peter 1, beginning at verse 8. If these things are yours and abound... You will be neither barren nor unfruitful. Verse 9, you lack these things, you're short-sighted, even blind, you forgot what got you here. Verse 10, therefore be even more diligent, more diligent, not less diligent, more diligent, to make your call and election sure. If you do these things, you will never stumble. An entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I I love that declaration. Never stumble. Never fall. Never fall away, it says in one translation. Peter focused on planned success. Should disciples be barren? No. Should disciples be unfruitful? No. Should you be stumbling? No. Should you be failing? No. Christianity's design is success. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings forgiveness. It brings deliverance. It brings transformation. And it brings success. The plan of God for everyone who would follow Christ is to succeed, to join with Him into glory, to make it unto the end. It's a plan for success. Man, God didn't robe Himself in flesh to create some kind of mediocre opportunity. His divine plan and purpose is not, cross your fingers. He didn't die on the cross and resurrect into glory. Hope that works. His death, burial, and resurrection wasn't a gamble. Regardless of our circumstance, regardless of our situation, regardless of our challenges or our victories, hear me today, succeeding is the Lord's plan for each and every one of us. Success is the way He coded it into the system. Success is the way it's been designed from the front end. He scratched the Old Testament and brought us the New Testament because He wanted something that worked, something that was guaranteed. Something that would take us ahead. Jesus said in John 10, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I like the new living. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. If you don't think your life is rich and satisfying today, hear the preacher. You're not walking in the way Jesus has designed this thing. You're not living in the way He's programmed this thing. The plan of God is success. Success. Succeeding. Living in victory. 
a pastor. I just don't think I can make it. Well, that's fine, preacher. Your history probably makes it easy to serve God. I just don't think this thing can work for me. That thinking is wrong. That's not biblical thinking. That kind of thinking needs to stop. It needs to be doused. It needs to be silenced. Success is written into the kingdom code. Above our self-doubt, above the enemy's accusations and whispers, Jesus' abundant promises are supreme. If you and I listen to self-doubt, we're going to lose. If you and I listen to the whispers of the enemy, we're going to lose. But if I listen to Jesus, then I win. Then I'm succeeding. Then I'm following along in the victory of Christ. Am I a perfect person? No. But I'm on the pathway following that perfect one. Let me share with you this aspect and we're fixing to pray. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. is how Peter opens his second letter. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like precious faith with us. One translation says, a faith of equal standing with ours. Another translation says, who share the same precious faith we have. Peter says, your faith, same as mine. Your faith, equivalent to mine. We've been provided the same faith. The faith that guided Peter guides you and I. The faith that empowered Peter empowers you and I. The faith that never failed him will not fail us. What faith are you talking about, preacher? I'll go to Peter's first letter. As Jude said, defend the faith. Not just faith is my response, but the faith. What's he talking about? First Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, you and I experience the same living hope as Peter. We know the same salvation provided by Jesus Christ. Same repentance. Same baptism in the name of Jesus. Same infilling of the Holy Spirit. That same faith that worked for Peter works for us. The same faith that transformed Peter transforms you and I. We enjoy what Peter enjoyed. We possess what Peter possessed. Peter or any of the apostles or any New Testament characters did not have a different faith than you and I. They weren't given a special faith, a more powerful faith. They weren't given some kind of superior faith. Well, they're the original 12. They had something special. Not according to Peter. And so the same faith. You know what that means today? For every one of us. Peter, James... John, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Stephen, we succeed by the same faith that they succeeded. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, 
and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Phoebe, and Lydia, and the woman at the well, and Dorcas. They all succeeded by faith, and we succeed in that same faith. Paul and, and Barnabas and Silas and Ananias and Cornelius, the same faith and the same success. How about these? Sopater of Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. Same faith, same success. What about all the others throughout the course of history and even in biblical times, folks whose names we do not know? How about the congregations in Rome, and Philippi, Caesarea, and Corinth, and Galatia, and Colossa, and Thessalonica, and Antioch, and Iconium, and Jerusalem, and Ephesus? Countless others like precious faith provide success for all followers of Christ from the very first one to confess and follow to the last one who does before he comes in his return. For every disciple, it's the same saving gospel. It's the same delivering faith for everyone who's overcome. You and I are able to overcome. For everyone who's lived successfully, you and I can live successfully. It's programmed into the plan. Our success begins. It's founded in like precious faith. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Repentance. Confession of my errors, my faults things I've done wrong, attitudes and demeanor, and turning 180, I give my life to Jesus. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ washes away every mistake I have made until in the eyes of God Almighty I am white as snow because His name is applied to my life. The infilling of the Spirit. Maybe I'll talk about it more next week. In fact, I will talk about it more next week. Same faith. Same. When I say it's coded into the program, if the program isn't functioning right, you got a bug. It was coded to succeed. If you got a bug, you get you some antivirus, or you buy a Mac. If you got a bug, you reboot. You load that program all over again. Clear it off. Reprogram. Because this thing was designed to succeed. I want you to hear this preacher today. Every one of us runs into troubles just like Peter. But Peter reminds us today fundamentally. It's not the design. It's not the design. The design is success Maintain the faith. Standing with me in this auditorium, maybe you need to reboot some repentance. Go ahead and stand with me. Maybe you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, washing away the errors and faults in your life. We'd love to baptize you in the name of Jesus today. Maybe you haven't been filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit or you need to re-stir that up. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you. 
You need to reboot that thing. Succeeding is what the kingdom is all about. Succeeding. As musicians play, I'm just calling you to faith today. Everybody in the room, I'm calling you to faith today. I'm calling you to respond. I'm calling you. You know what? Maybe you need to just declare again, this is about success. And I'm in for succeeding. Uh, Maybe you need to declare today some things in prayer as the Word of God challenged you in this house right now. Go ahead and reach out to Him in your own words, in your own understanding. Begin to talk to the Lord in this place right now. I need you, Jesus. I I need, Lord, my faith to be reinvigorated. I I need my faith to be stirred again, Lord, by the power of Your Holy Ghost power. I I need You to minister, O God, into my life right now. It's my desire, O Lord. Uh, I've been lied to by the enemy. Um, I've been deceived. Uh, I've been somebody been whispering in my ear, Lord, my flesh. Lord, my own circumstance, the enemy has whispered to me that I couldn't make it. It's whispered to me that I wouldn't succeed. But I choose your gospel. I choose the testimony of the apostle Peter. I choose the witness of the scripture that I am built by your kingdom for success. That your glory in me is designed and coded and programmed for success, Lord. There's a reason I've titled this series Succeeding. Because it carries progression, ongoing. I didn't label this, I am a success. Because that sounds like we're finished. And it's important that we recognize a process. It's really very, very important to recognize it's a process. Because it keeps each of us from being defeated. I could look at Brother Mark, Sister Kathy, and, well, look at their this, 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 thus, and so, and I'm not this, 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 thus, and so. I'm a failure. No. They've just been at it longer than me. They've been surrendered more. Surrendered in different areas. Perhaps if we sit down and had coffee, they would look at me and say, well, he's got this, thus, so, that, and this. Succeeding. Succeeding. As our flesh. For some of us, it's more our flesh than it is the enemy. Because we hear the words of some harmful person in the past or maybe in the present that nothing we did was ever good enough. So we come to Christ expecting the same kind of reiteration. And the enemy jumps on that bandwagon. He doesn't have to whisper anything. He just gets to magnify what ignorant humans have spoken into our lives. Somebody needs to hear me right now. Succeeding. Anytime I hear any voice, I don't need to declare it's flesh or the enemy. But if it says to me, you cannot serve God, that is not God. You cannot follow after Him. Whatever the reason, that is not God. Succeeding. It's in the code. Part of me wants to spend a few moments and call each of you by name. It's his design that you succeed. That's what he's about, is that you would succeed. Thank 
Succeeding. Not perfection. That won't happen until we are caught up into heaven and our bodies are changed into like His heavenly body. That's when perfection comes. Until then, it's a pro succeeding. Moving in the right direction. Starts with like precious faith. Like precious faith. Pick your favorite Bible character whose traits you admire following after the Lord of glory and know you have the same faith. Work for them. It'll work for me. If it doesn't seem to be working, Peter gives us some, well, some antivirus. If the software's not running properly. There's programs you can run. Do I have a bug? Find out what it is and eliminate that. Peter gives us some things. There's eight or nine of them that we need to possess and we need to propagate. That's our antivirus. Never fail. If we possess and propagate these aspects, these attributes, I hope you'll join with me and learn what the great apostle Peter had to say. as he's closing the chapter on his humanity. I want you to have this. I want you to know this. Because I want you to succeed. Woo. Such power in that book. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord today. For your availability. For your availability to the power and presence of God and His holy word. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series or join us online at livingfaithministries.church.